All right, I'm going to hit start webinar, guys. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Adventure Forum presented by Adventures on the Gorge. I am Chris Hayes, your forum host, coming to you live from Adventures on the Gorge Resort on the very rim of the New River Gorge, America's newest national park and preserve. For all of our viewers out there who are joining us, Zoom or Facebook Live, if you have any questions for our guest, please use Zoom's question and answer function or Facebook comments to submit them at any time. Near the end, we'll open the discussion up to questions from viewers if time allows. The ironically named New River is old, and I mean really old. In fact, it's one of the oldest rivers in the world. As long as there have been people in West Virginia, there have been people in the river, on the river, and using the river to make their lives easier. Much of that history we've learned through careful archaeology of first American sites, but a large chunk of but a large chunk of it we know because we know because it was carefully documented by the people who lived that history. Either way, the history of the people running the rapids of the New River is truly wild and wonderful. Tonight I am joined by three experts on the history of human travel on the mighty New River. First, we have Dave Arnold. He's one of the founders of Adventures on the Gorge. And in fact, Adventures on the Gorge still sits on the same site on the rim of the New River Gorge, where he and his compatriots founded Class Six River Runners. In the years since, Dave has developed an amateur historian's interest in all things New River. Next up, we've got David Hurst. He is the Cultural Resource Program Manager for the New River Gorge Park and Preserve. And he is also, he is also an archeologist and recognized as the news official historian. And last but not least, we have Dylan Schumacher, who serves as the vice president of the Virginia Canal Society and is one of the organizers of the annual, annual James River Bateau Festival. In 2012, Dylan crewed a bateau called the Mary Marshall, the journey of which reenacted a very famous bateau expedition. And with that, we're gonna lead right into the questions for these guys. Um, first, uh, for David first. Um, the New River Gorge has become internationally known for its whitewater rafting. However, we believe it's important to know more about the history of boating and transportation in this area. Can you talk about how the Native Americans traveled on and used the New River? Yes. Uh, yes. Now, when you look at it, uh, the history, uh, the early history, uh, there, there is plenty of evidence, you know, um, from the French and Indian War and during the, you know, the period where we had the Battle of Point Pleasant, 1774, that Native Americans, Shawnee, Miami, all of these tr tribes that we know about historically had canoes and they used them on the river and they were the perfect kind of boat because they were lightweight and you could pick them up on your back and portage, carry them over, you know, from one stream to the other. So, so we know that we know that they had watercraft like that. Um, archaeologically, there isn't any evidence of, uh, you know, we don't have any um, canoes. Um, we don't have any dugout canoes like you find, say, in, in North Carolina in some of the lakes and, and ponds and such like that. But we know, we know that, uh, we know that uh, you know, Native Americans um, did have canoes and they, they no doubt did go down the river um, and would have to you know, pick up their canoes and carry them around the, around the rapids. So there's no, there's no doubt about that. And when you, when you look at the um, archeological sites along the river, when you, when you go from um, say Hinton down to, uh, you know, around the, uh, uh, the, the bridge, the New River Gorge Bridge, you know, there are terraces and such that along the river where you do, there are Indian sites, they're, you know, buried sites. So we know that, uh, we know that Indians camped along the, along the river and they no doubt use canoes to cross the river. So um, um, we just don't have any direct evidence of that. Um, but 
as far as travel routes, there's no there's no doubt that you know people did travel on the river, and um, there's places along there that are are um, perfect for fishing and, and such like that. So, so um, you know, it's it's a reasonable statement to, to, to say that they did travel along the river. Now, if, if you look at the bigger picture, though, the bigger picture of travel routes through the area, there's really kind of two kind of travel routes. There's the main travel routes that bypassed, they went around, they went around the gorge itself because to go through the gorge, it's a circuitous route. It's not the fastest way to get from point A to point B. Um, and this is documented. There were there were trails that went around, went around the, the gorge, and like the Midland Trail, Giles Fay and Canal Turnpike. These are routes that were straddling the watersheds, and and so they, they would uh, leave out, um, say down around uh, Trump, Crump's Bottom, and go out around and come back down to the Canal Valley, around Gawley Bridge, or something like that. So, but. Uh, I think canoes would have been very important for other kinds of travel that were where people were going uh, east to west instead of going around the gorge they wanted to cross so places like uh, sandstone where you get below below the rapids uh, there are there's a lot of archaeological sites down there and and there's no doubt that the people were using canoes we just don't have any direct evidence of it so um, but if you go around the area if you go into you know Greater Virginia at that time, you know there are there are um, examples of this in in the history books. So that's a that's a long long answer to a short question. <laughs> well, let me ask you. Um, you know, you mentioned that they uh, Native Americans may have uh, camped along the river. Was, is there any evidence along the New River of like a, a major major settlements? Right. Um, that's a good question. Um, when you when you look at um, you know, the archeological sites, you have to remember there are people living in the gorge for 14,000 years. You know, there were um, in, in and around the gorge for 14,000 years. So, you know, back when, uh, when, uh, when you had Native Americans, you know, um, living with the uh, mammoth and mastodon back, you know, back in the age when you didn't need a, you know, a, a hunting license, you know, you just went out and hunted. But um, no, if you, if you are, um, uh, there's really kind of uh, two types of sites that um, you have in, in the gorge. There's some that are um, smaller, um, more of a camping or some, sometimes a hamlet size. And then you get, when you get um, upstream from say Meadow Creek and on some of the, where the river starts to widen, I mean, the uh, floodplain starts to widen out, you get more agricultural sites. So um, that would be, that's later in the, later that's something like say about 1100 AD you're getting people living in villages and and if you get up into you know go up into Crump's Bottom and go upstream you get bigger bigger villages you know that are just uh, you know there are many of them. Cool. Um, Dave, uh, David Arnold, um, when whitewater boaters talk about first ascents they mean the people who ran those rivers uh, and streams and creeks first. Most of the waterway, waterways that uh, recreational West Virginia boaters run have first recorded descents in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Like the gully, for example, had an attempt in 1959 and then a first successful run in, in 1961. But the New River Gorge has a first recorded descent dated in 1812, well over a century earlier. Um, do you know you know who led that expedition and what the purpose of that expedition was? Uh, absolutely. Um, probably one of the most famous trips ever down the New River Gorge. But um, before I go into that, just a quick comment on David first. Um, David speaks as a, uh, a scientist, as an archaeologist. Um, I, I'd like to address that just from a boatman's perspective. Uh, you know, the American Indians ran rivers a lot. They were their interstate systems. They were their highways. If they weren't running a river, there was a trail next to a river, you know, and creeks, you know, the trail up Paint Creek and where David was referring to were some people in Midland Trail where they went around the gorge. But, you know, since we're talking about Batoza Little, 
one of the things that really struck me was listening to some um, songs of the early boatmen and the early boatmen of the Bateaux were almost all African-American. But if you listen to their songs or you listen to their poetry, um, it is it could easily have been written by River Guide today. What I mean by that is they understood the excitement that comes from running a rapid. They understood uh, what it meant to understand current. And they, they knew to laugh at people that didn't understand how to use current to your advantage. And I think that same thing obviously happened with the American Indians. You know, maybe they started by running boats from, you know, down the Scioto in Ohio and they didn't run much white water, but they ran some. And, I, I think that they eventually learned to run whitewater and I think some people got better at it. Now, I don't have any proof of this. David needs proof and I understand that. But <laughs> I, think, I, think, <laughs> I think to assume that the American Indians did not run the lower gorge or at least most of the new river is absurd. I mean, we know they were there. Anybody that's a boatman today, anybody that's a river runner today knows that if you're a young buck and you're learning how to run rivers, you're going to go further and further. You're going to go from class two water to class three. And eventually, you know, someone's going to bet you, you know, a bag of wampum or tobacco you can't before and you do it. So anyway, I, I'm really uh, strongly believe people have been running uh, boats for a long time. Here's one little fact, though, that gives that. Since we're talking about bateaux, um, the Rucker family, as um, Dylan was, will say later, you know, they have the patent, if the patent still exists or some question, but on the bateaux, about 20 years before that, the Rose family, uh, they, they, were at, um, they were the first people that designed the bateau, and in some of the literature, what they talk about is copying the American Indians' boats. They actually even tried to tie two of the American Indian dugouts together to make a boat that could transport goods. Um, so, I mean, they were learning from the American Indians. But anyway, to your question, the 1812 expedition is probably the famous expedition, uh, I would profess, maybe on the, in the eastern United States on a river. Uh, President George Washington really, really, really wanted to figure out how to move commerce from the Atlantic, across the Alleghenies, uh, into the Ohio system, and then wherever the Ohio system took them. You know, they, he looked at that and said, this is something we have to do. This is one of those transformative, you gotta do this. And John Marshall, who was a Supreme Court justice, uh, was in the American Revolution with uh, George Washington. They were friends. Uh, he, they assigned a group of people, or over 20 of them, uh, Dylan may know more of how many, to look at an expedition that would go from Lynchburg all the way to uh, the confluence with the Kanawha. And this was absolutely remarkable. Mm -hmm. Even today, it's just mind boggling to me. Um, and maybe for some people that don't know much about a bateau, and I know we'll get into that later, but you know, a bateau was a big boat, a really big boat, 50 foot. They ran this trip in the late fall, which as we all know was probably low. And they talk on the trip of it being extremely dry that they were in a really bad drought. Um, these boats drafted, if they were light 12 inches, you know, if they were heavy 18, maybe even more. So to maneuver this, these boats um, through all the rapids in Virginia, to get them and move them across the Allegheny Continental Divide to get to Howard's Creek on the Greenbrier, which is where they, they that's where they put back in the water and the water flowing to uh, New Orleans. And then to go down the Greenbrier, to get to Sandstone, take the boat out of the waters and portage around Sandstone Falls, then to run the rapids that we all know so well in the New River Gorge. Um, it appears they ran all the rapids, um, maybe roped some, maybe did some work, but the only time that I'm aware that they took the boat out, and again, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but was Sandstone Falls. And interesting enough, we did a reenactment of, 
a bateau trip. It wasn't John Marshall's trip. We, meaning the National Park Service, David's well aware of it, uh, for what I believe was the 25th anniversary. I had the honor to be on that trip to actually run um, the bow rig uh, for part of the trip. We ran Brooks Falls. Some of you guys know Brooks, which is, you know, a 50 some foot, 60 foot boat is a pretty big deal. Um, and we portaged around sandstone with um, horses. Uh, I don't know what they were, but a large workhorse, like a Percheron kind of horse. Um, so we actually did um, some living history. And it was, I told Jay, it was probably my favorite day on the river ever. I've probably got close to a thousand trips on the New Ngali. And if I had to pick one day, it was probably that day. Um, just the magic of running those big boats was just phenomenal. But that's enough time. The, it, I, I'll, I'll wait with this. I highly recommend you Google and you read about the 1812 expedition. It is mind boggling. And by the way, Marshall was in his late 50s at this time. This, he wasn't a young buck. Um, and uh, they, they had very harsh weather and very dry weather. But please, if you get a chance, Google it, read it. It's amazing. Oh, and uh, just to address your response to uh, David, uh, sounds like maybe uh, you're thinking some of the uh, Native Americans might have just t been testing each other's skills out there. Hey, who can do this? <laughs> and it's oh, funny I, that, that young yeah. men and women still do that very much today with each, yeah. with each well, other. Well, I, I don't. I don't disagree with really, you know, this uh, speculating about, you know, the use of canoes, like, like, for example, um, there's one account, historical account of some, um, an Indian raid into Greenbrier County, and they took some hostages, including some children. And when they, they tried to, they crossed the, they crossed the river um, and went up the blue, bluestone. There's, there's a, it's an account that, uh, that there were canoes there. So they obviously, you know, obviously had canoes in that area to get back and forth across, get back and forth across the river. So I, I wouldn't doubt it. It's just to, to what extent would they be running the river in canoes? Well, it's it probably, it was probably done. I just, I don't know. Maybe it, it probably was done. But um, when you look at, uh, you know, if you're talking about like you, you want to use the river to get from point A to point B, it's instead of the circuitous route that the river takes, the time it would take to go from point A to point B, it'd be much faster that to, to get up on, you know, get a, go overland and then come out where you want to get to. And, uh, and, and indeed, this is when, whenever, whenever there are accounts of, of, um, raids and then the Indians uh, leaving, that's what they do. Okay. Now, um, there, there are, uh, there's another account, there's a place down there at Stretcher Neck, um, you're probably you're familiar with because I think uh, Dave in the bateau went around there. I remember being there watching them come around the bend. There's a, a place there called Warfording. And uh, one of the park um, rangers, Frank Sellers, he did some research on this and found out that that word Warfording actually referred to warriors fording. So they actually crossed right there and, hmm. and then on their way to attacking some of the Greenbrier settlements. So um, there's no doubt that this happened. Now, um, it's, uh, I think um, Dave bringing up that, uh, that uh, John Marshall, that map is extraordinary, an extraordinary map and has a lot of details on it. Um, one of the things that he shows uh, at Sandstone Falls w was when he got there, the Richmond family had built a mill there. And so they had already built a, a, um, a water course, you know, from Sandstone Falls so that the, that the uh, people could take bateaus down, down to the mill, which is at, at the far end. So when you go to, when you go to Sandstone Falls, you cross over that bridge and you look downstream. Um, you, that's actually the channel that was uh, the mill race, so to speak, that was taking uh, taking the water down to a dammed area where the mill was at. And um, another place, Camp Brookside, has a uh, you know another way to get get around. They had there was a channel that was dug in the slough that goes around 
a, a Camp Brookside. It creates the island, so to speak. And, and that, uh, that actually, if you go there, there's actually a towpath. There's towpaths where they used oxen to pull the bateaus around. There was a mill there as well. So these are ways that you could get around the rough water. Uh, mm -hmm. Bateaus, I, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure you can, there's ways you can get them downstream, but this way you would, it would avoid the, you know, the, the direct dangers. And uh, finally, um, uh, as I mentioned in one of the messages, e my emails, um, that um, <clears throat> some of the rapids upstream, they're, they're actually uh, dynamited to create sluices or channels where the, the water was, was calm or there weren't any, as many rocks in the way. So you could bring your bateau down. But bateaus are very important because they were used to carry the, you know, to carry corn and other kinds of uh, uh, grains down to these mills, and uh, the one at uh, the one at the uh, that you've got at uh, um, Sandstone Falls was a major operation. <clears throat> In fact, um, now you mentioned this map, uh, 1812, but there's another set of maps that uh, we got our hands on that were made by a fellow named Charles Bryan Shaw, and it's sh it, these maps were made between 1851 and 1854, and they show the river. Uh, before the railroads came through and, and the coal mining went on. And where the, when uh, Charles Brian Shaw went past Sandstone Falls, he actually mapped in the mill that was there. So there's, there's a, there's a um, you know, there, there is a connection between the, you know, the operations of these bateaus and, uh, and then, you know, the, this water powered early industrial development that you see in, in the mills, the grist mills. So um, uh, that's it's just some, something else to think about when you're, when you're talking about running the river. Um, I, it's amazing that those boats can, can withstand all the difficulties, you know, that you've got in, you know, when, when you're going down, downstream. I mean, I, yeah. I, I wasn't on the boat. I was just watching. <laughs> I heard it. Well, well, that being said, let's, uh, I'm going to flip over to Dylan here. Uh, we've been throwing around this word bateau um, quite a bit, and I'm sure there's quite a few people out there that may not know what a bateau is. Can you give us an explanation of, of and a description of how a bateau works? Sure. So a bateau essentially was the primary means of transporting commerce in the U.S. along the eastern seaboard, seaboard mainly along the James River and, of course, the New River um, from 1775 until 1840. So the overall length of the boat was approximately 58 feet long, and that varies, but that was about the average that we found. Um, and I use the, the term we very liberally, liberally here, um, but that, that was found in the uh, Great Basin dig outside of Richmond. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it was about 58 feet long. Um, and so in Virginia, along the James River, they were primarily used to transport tobacco. And so tobacco was used, was put into hogsheads, which was essentially giant barrels. And those hogsheads got standardized, the size got standardized um, in the late 1700s and basically they were about 48 inches long so the overall width of the boat was about 48 inches to accommodate the hogshead um <clears throat> so the overall construction of the boat there are ribs there you go and so as you can see in the picture there um at the bow and the stern there are two giant oars or sweeps that are used for steering the boats. And then there's poles across of the bateau, which were used for propelling the boat up or down the river. And the overall construction, there was ribs um, approximately three to four feet apart. And then you had smaller pieces of lumber that were nailed to the ribs and planked along the boat. And as we mentioned earlier, I believe was Dave, you said that they drafted about 12 inches of water. That is correct. Um, without a load on them, they drafted about 12 inches and fully loaded, 
they could hold anywhere from 10 to 12 hogsheads of tobacco. And when they had that full load on it, they would draft about 18 inches of water. Mm. Um, and so the bateaus ran along the James River all the way up to about 1840 uh, in the US, or sorry, in, in Virginia. And essentially what happened when the canal got built in Lynchburg, the packet boats took over as a primary means of transport. And then railroads took over after that because the technology advanced. Um, but yeah, that's basically what a bateau is. It's a shallow white oak uh, vessel. Is, is, there a, uh, is there somewhere, Dylan, where people can go in this day and age and see a, a, a bateau in action? There absolutely is. It's called the James River Bateau Festival. Mm -hmm. Happens every year in June. Uh, this year it will be starting in Lynchburg on June 19th. And it's a week long trip. We go from Lynchburg all the way to Maiden's Landing in Powhatan, Virginia, which was primarily where the James River transported, mm -hmm. the James River Bateau transported the tobacco coming out of the, the farmlands to Lynchburg and then down outside of Richmond. Um, yes, cool. sir. And, uh, but when, and when is that? You said it's in June this year? Yes, sir. It starts June 19th. Cool. cool. Hey, Chris, um, I can add something to just try to help. Uh, just so I can try to help with uh, people to understand. First thing is, you mentioned um, the basin. Um, a little background on that. So, you know, CSM Railroad has a lot of land uh, in Richmond. They went to develop it. They started digging. They found a boat. Um, the archaeologists came in. Um, I don't know, Dylan. I, I heard they found like 73 boats before it was all done. Um, now, a couple things about that. There is very little knowledge of what a New River Bateau looks like. There is some debate on it. Um, I actually think I know where there is a New River Bateau, Barry and, and the Hinton family. There, there, yeah, there go. we go. We got a picture. Absolutely. We got a picture of one there. But here's what's really important. They were very different. They weren't, they, they, they were customized to some extent. Like, like Dylan said, you know, they were moving hogsheads. They had some, you know, they had to be a certain size to fit the hogsheads and stuff. But there was, there was a lot of differences in them. Um, the second thing, just to give you a picture that I think is really interesting, at the peak, uh, there were over 500 boats moving up and down the James. Now, a crew of four was pretty much required. You had to have somebody in the back on the sweep, somebody in the bow, and you had to have two people pulling. So, you know, that's at a minimum. So you're talking 2,000 boatmen. So I compare it a lot to, to New River Gorge today. You know, we maybe have 2,000 boatmen here. Um, it, it, this was a big deal. This wasn't some, you know, a boat here and a boat there. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, they, if you, if, they were very prevalent, Dave. I mean, that was the primary means of transporting cargo. And so how people yeah. made their money. And I'd also like to point out that the biggest difference between, and we don't have a lot of evidence, but if you see in the picture here, the bow and the stern, so the, the front nose cones, and these boats were designed to have removable nose cones um, right here. So this is a New River Bateau, and you notice how there's a lot more rocker, a lot more lift. A James River Bateau would be more straight across uh, mm -hmm. coming along the body, and the reason for that was is because of the higher volume of water in the New River. Yeah. And for example, the when we built the, the Mary Marshall, it was modeled after James River Bateau. And when we ran through the gorge, we actually put um, we built we took some some wood and we screwed it on the bow of the boat as splash guards. Mm -hmm. So when the white water was hitting, it would disperse outwards and not get up in the boat. Now, with that being said, when we, we were running through the Keenies, we almost swamped the boat, <laughs> which is another story. I've, 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 I've seen the video. <laughs> Would it be Let possible just... to put the picture of the, uh, the bateau on New River up again? 
Is that sure. No, not that one, Dylan. The one, is the one that Jay put up. Jay put sure. up. Can you put that up again, Jay? Is that possible? If not, no big deal. Hey, well, he's looking at that. Hey, on it. Stand by. Hey, David, that 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 picture is from the Library of Congress. Um, it's uh, supposedly at Stump's Bottom on the New River. Do you have any idea where that is? I have no idea. Well, I, I've always, I've always uh, been told, uh, and, and I'm trying to remember the name of that gentleman from Virginia, Doctor So and So, that was around. He was at, he was on the shore with me at uh, Army Camp when you came by. Um, yep. Uh, and I can't remember his name, uh, but but. Uh, my recollection is that that picture on the outside was from around Avis or somewhere over, you know, upstream from Hinton. Yeah. Um, I might be, might be wrong about that. that's my recollection though. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let me just add one thing, um, just slip in here. Um, uh, I agree, I totally agree that, um, that these bateaux were uh, used, you know, to carry commerce, you know, I mean, they were, they, that's, they they would go you know and they're using for they use as ferries you know across the river but they would also go up and down the river mm -hmm. and uh i so i think i think uh the fact that though like the the richmond mill that one uh dates to like uh right run it's before it was there before uh john uh chief justice marshall came down the river so we know we know it's present and it was there up until 1850 at least but uh, so so there's there's no doubt that uh, that it was there. But I think the fact that um, people like uh, people were settling the bottoms, clearing the bottom land, and all that, I think that, that suggests that um, there was this this movement to commerce uh, was and much earlier. I mean, because uh, these mills, the size of the mill, like the the mill at uh, Sandstone Falls, uh, that that's just people are, are trying to get back something on an investment. You know, it, was, it took a lot of work to build that, a lot of work. And, uh, and so they wouldn't have done that unless they had some notion about their kind of return. So I think the, the bateaus running up and down, I think there might've been a lot of those at one time. I agree with you. I think there was probably quite, a, quite an army of them and people were, you know, they could use the, use the river to, you know, to bring them down. So, so I, uh, you know, if there's some metric you could do on it, it'd be interesting to see the capacity of one of those, um, you know, how many, how many uh, hogsheads you could put in, in one of those and, you know, determine, you know, that for, for the purposes of commerce. But now there's, there's another thing I think um, we have to be, think about here too, is that, but, uh, and I've, I just recently watched a movie about uh, some of the logging operations in Maine and they had some very rapid rivers and they were carrying you know, logs from logging operations down hundreds of miles, or at least a hundred miles down, down some of these streams. And so in, in the movie, it shows um, a little bit more substantial uh, bateau, but they were running the, running the rapids and they used them uh, to shuffle the, the logs around so they wouldn't be jams and such like that. So, um, you know, in addition to being used for just to transport uh, grains and corn and things like that. I think it's very possible that early on, uh, some it, you know the nascent um, logging industry that we would have had people needed log. I mean, they needed boards and such like that. Uh, that that bateaus might have been used for a similar purpose, just to kind of like carry logs downstream. So um, I, I don't know any any evidence of that, but but it's a possibility. Uh, hey Chris, um, we may have to we may have to move on, but if, if possible, if you have time, and no big deal if you don't, if you could throw that picture up, I just want to point something out in that picture, Jay. Is it too late? <laughs> no, I'll bring it back. Hang on. Okay. Well, while he's bringing it up, let me tell you a few things. Um, one thing about that picture, if you notice, the crew is African American. So before um, uh, you know, slavery was abolished. Um, they were obviously mostly slaves. After, um, after the emancipation, they still, they had a skill, you know, they knew how to run whitewater. It was a very valuable skill. They knew how to run rivers. They understood current mm -hmm. movement. 
but they're, they're almost always male and they're almost always African-American. Um, a couple other things, and Dylan, you may point out something, but the, the first thing, you know, on the James, they were moving a lot of, uh, you know, but on the new, you can see on the bank, they're laying on those bags. We're not sure what's in there, but it was probably corn and it was probably going down to one of the mills uh, to be turned into cornmeal. The big, uh, what's the big cargo that's in the boat was probably bark for tannin. Um, it, you know, it wouldn't have been tobacco because they, like Dylan was saying, they would have protected it, kept it dry. They'd had it in big barrels or hogsheads. So they moved a lot of tannin for the leather industry. Um, you'll see somebody that has a horn. Um, it appears to be like an oar. It's going across the boat, but I'm pretty sure that's actually a boat horn, which was very common. And you'll also see the big um, oar that are there. They actually have a big metal yoke that they sit in. But they're monstrous. I mean, they're, they're, I don't know, Dylan, you probably know, probably 18 feet. Uh, 15, 17 feet, obviously it depended on the boat, but there's a lot of things in this picture. Um, you will also see the poles that are laying across the gunnels. Um, the, the boats were preferred to be moved by pulling. One of the problems with like the lower gorge was that it was too deep. Um, they liked shallow water. They didn't like it too shallow because you know, they could get their boat messed up, but um, the primary way to move these boats down or upstream was by putting a big pole in the water and there were walking planks on both sides and they would walk along those planks pushing the boat upstream or downstream. Mm -hmm. You wanna add anything to that, Dylan, about that picture? I mean, and the biggest mystery to me is how a New River bateau would actually, uh, instead of using poles, what they would have used. And the only thing I can think of is that they would have used paddles, um, which I'm, I remember running the the Keeney um, rapid on the New River Gorge, and we actually had paddles on the boat. And it was funny because earlier that day we were kind of discussing whether or not we were going to throw paddles on. Yep, right there. <laughs> and uh, you know that saying, it's uh, better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. That was uh, one of those situations because I'm really cool. glad we had it because as we were. <clears throat> Originally, our plan was to sneak uh, Whale Rock on, on River Left to avoid the, the meat of the rapid. But last minute decision, um, Andrew decided to run the meat. And as we were coming through, Kevin, who was in the stern of the boat, um, cocked us, pointing us to River Left. And the paddles essentially propelled us away from the meat grinder down through Lower Keeney safely. And that's the only thing I can think of tying all that back into your original comment, Dave, about the poles and how they were used. Yeah, on the upper part of the new, the Greenbrier, um, you would have used poles. On the James River, you would have used poles. But getting to the, like the deeper sections of the new, I'm guessing they would have had to use some sort of paddle to propel the bateau forward. But that's just a guess. Um, you know, they, they, they also use the uh, stern and the bow rig to set a ferry angle, mm -hmm. just, like, just like we today, if we're crossing, we'll set a ferry angle in a paddle boat or an oar boat. So you can use, uh, when we ran, we would use the stern and the rear, uh, uh, they're basically rudders is what they are, but yeah. we would use them like oars and mm -hmm. we would set a ferry angle and you could have, do a half decent chance. You, you can ferry the boat fairly, fairly reasonably. The sure. other thing that's kind of neat is, is sometimes they didn't bring the boat back upstream. It was too hard to do it. And those boats would be taken apart and they would be used to build a home or something. There have been some bateau parts found, uh, for example, is a mantle in a log cabin. You know, um, there's a log cabin and they're looking at it and they go, wow. This mantle is a part of a bateau. Right, and or, or very made with uh, cut nails that they would have used on the boats. And uh, there, there's other places like that outside of Richmond where the same thing happened. If the river got too high, they would have just dismantled the, the, the bateau there. Yep. 
Hey, um, guys, one, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry. They, one, they, real they, quick, real quick, just one other comment about that historical photo um, is that um, uh, it's very possible that some of the people in that picture are actually former slaves. We, we have, you know, we have like, there are in our, some of our coal mining towns, we, we have, you know, evidence of people that, you know, that were going to the churches that were former slaves. So it's very possible some of those, some of those people in that, in that picture were, were um, you know, originally on a plantation somewhere in, in Virginia. All right, I'm gonna take a quick break, quick program break here. If you're just joining us, welcome to the Adventure Forum. Um, every other week, we are hosting discussions on topics of interest for both local and traveling adventurers. Um, we are live here, or I am live here at Adventures on the Gorge uh, Resort on the very rim of the New River Gorge National Park. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the question and answer on Zoom or into the comments on Facebook Live. Now, earlier, um, Dylan had mentioned uh, the advent of, of the, uh, the railroads and how that changed things through technology. And so Dave Arnold, uh, I've got a question here for you regarding uh, Collis Huntington, um, who I did a little bit of reading about today. And it's pretty interesting. And he obviously had a very major impact in West Virginia um, regarding transportation. And could you explain how, who he was, what he did, how, how that changed things for the New sure. River Gorge? So, you know, I profess that the Marshall Expedition was the most significant, the most famous. Some should make a bad, but um, the most famous expedition in the toes was the Huntington Expedition. So, what, what was going on is, um, you know, Dylan um, pointed this out that things like the railroad basically put the, the death spike into the bateau trade. You know, here you are moving whatever it is, corn. Uh, by the way, the, the bateaus, some of them moved coal. So here you are moving commerce by a boat and there's a chance that a train can come along and move a hundred, a thousand times as much weight. So, you know, they originally, as David first pointed out, they started to try to make uh, raceways and literally blast out channels so that the bateaus could move easier. And then all of a sudden technology changed, like technology changes everything today and they start building railroads and everybody starts to realize um, this is, this is, is going to be, you know, dead on the on arrival. So Washington, George Washington to have canal, bateau movement from Richmond to Cincinnati, uh, that dream was squashed and the new dream was could you build a railroad? Uh, Collis Huntington had just finished building, he was one of the financial people that helped build the Transcontinental Railroad, and he was called in to help from a financial standpoint. Uh, they had built a lot of the railroad towards West Virginia. Um, they were running from both ends. They were running from the east and from the west. They knew in the middle they had this problem, which was the New River Gorge. By the way, they connected it right below Adventures on the Gorge, I mean, directly below is where the connection was finally made um, in January of 1873. Mm -hmm. uh, the, anyway, so Collis Huntington was called in, they wanted his money, they wanted his financial backing. Well, he was kind of a cool guy and he was like, well, I wanna know about this. N not only was he not willing to put his money up until he saw it, but he also was, he had an adventurous spirit. And they went to who were the best bateau people, just like today, you know, when National Geographic wanted to run Colca Canyon, they went, who's the best rear guide you guys got? And Robin Moore, who's one of our guides, went and led the expedition on Colca. So they did the same thing. They brought a, a group in that were probably the best river runners there were. The Dempsey family out of Anstead was really good. They brought in a, a Hinton, the Hinton family out of Hinton were really good, and they brought in some of the best boatmen on the New River, and they ran a similar trip to the 1812 trip. One of the things I think was kind of unique is they they wanted, I'm not sure if they did this because of leadership skills or just plain PR, but they brought a couple generals into the to the expedition 
Um, I, there were, I believe, David, you, you can help me with this if I'm wrong. I believe there were three Confederate generals on that trip. And they did run uh, the New River Gorge in a bateau just like Marshall did. So the trip I was on that we've talked about is we put, we put in at Hinton. It was a living history trip. I represented one of the generals. and um, uh, General Arnold. <laughs> General Arnold, yeah. And uh, anyway, it, it was very significant because it's how they built the railroad. It wasn't the sole way they did it, but it did a couple things. It, it got Carl Huntington to write the check. It did bring in, you know, when they were building the railroad, when they, and the, you know, so much of that was hand and, you know, very primitive way of building it. They would bring in things like food and just the same way a bateau was used for movement of goods and they would bring it in for the workers and then the boats would move out and they'd get more and bring. So they were used basically as support for the railroad team that was building the railroad. But the, the, the Collins, the Collins Huntington expedition was about selling, selling the idea. That's why it had a PR component to it. And by selling uh, calls for his money. That, that's he, what was, I, he was eager to do it. Yeah, that's what I had read mostly about was that he was a railroad man. I didn't know about the uh, the the bateau expedition that they ran through. Yeah, and um, think about, think about this, Huntington, this town of Huntington in West Virginia is that's who it's named after, Collis. Yeah. And Marshall University is named after Chief Justice John Marshall. You know, it. it anyway. Cool. Anybody, David? You anybody want to add to that? Um, well, I, yeah, I'll jump in here with a question for David that yeah. kind of related to that, that, mm -hmm. you know, the, the resulting railroads that came from that uh, obviously opened the New River Gorge up to much more industrial coal mining and, and more and uh, other commerce in the area. Um, how important is New River Gorge coal to America's history? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I can combine that question with the next one. Um, okay, no, very good. important. It's very important, and uh, in fact, the 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 reason that uh, the New River uh, Gorge was established in the first place was because of that history. And uh, you know, Nuttleberg has a story, and, uh, and it's great. You, the whitewater rafting folks tell this story quite well, and that is, you know, that uh, it was, uh, you know, Henry Ford in there that makes that a nationally significant site. But Nuttall, Nuttall, John Nuttall was there before, and he was one of the earliest, you know, the earliest people to recognize the high quality Sewell seam coal that's there. It's a smokeless coal. It's incredibly good coal, and it's really good for making coke um, as well. And um, and so, um, so it's a, it's a it's a very very fundamentally important thing uh, that relates to the park's mission. And, you know, I mean, it, it's part of the early industrial development of the country. If you didn't, you know, you needed to have coal. And, uh, and so, you know, you combined it in the network with the other resources, you know, like the iron. So a lot of the, you know, the coal was being taken up to places like uh, Cleveland and Pittsburgh, where they were, they had access to uh, the iron from the Masabi range, you know, that came on the Great Lakes. So you had the railroads and the Coal and just all, all were part of this early industrial development that went on. And uh, America wouldn't have been what it was, you know, without that development. So very, very important. What about uh, some of the, the coal camps and, and towns that were on the new and, and uh, where are there? I know there's a lot of uh, historical sites that are within the uh, New River Gorge Park and Preserve. Um, where can those be found? Well, um, you know, the, early, the first ones that are in there, they, they actually, like Nuttall, he, he could see what was coming. They knew that the railroad was being built. So these, these early entrepreneurs, the people that actually lived in those towns, like Nuttall, Barry uh, is another one, um, they placed their, their, um, their towns and developed their towns around the railroad. I mean, the railroad was was always something they didn't have complete control over, but they knew they had to be along it. So, so that so you see, you know, uh, uh, them hitting the major seams too. You know that you, you get there. It's again, it's a Sewell. The Sewell seam is the the most important 
Um, now, one thing I think the, the whitewater rafting industry will uh, probably appreciate is that last year, about a year, a year ago uh, today, uh, we went down in the gorge. Uh, I went down there with a contractor and we, we looked at uh, almost 800 Coke ovens and we, we, we did a study on them. And so there's a, something, if you want to uh, carry this forward with your, with your, um, you know, your clients, uh, where the, you know we 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 have information now to interpret them, you know, in Nuttleburg and Kmore, and and uh, some of these some of these other towns, Rush Run, some um, Red Ash, places like that, where you can take your your folks in and and actually see this see um, this in, and and Caperton is another place too where you can actually go in and use this report to to uh, talk about those places, you know, that, you know, at a lunch, if you're going for, you know, break, take a break, break at lunch and go in there and see something like that. So I recommend, I re recommend, uh, I recommend you take a look at that. Um, and there is a big difference. I mean, um, the coking industry was a way to add value to the, uh, to the coal. It was a way to uh, either get really all in on it, like they did at Kmore, where they had huge coke ovens. I mean, there were five ton capacity, back-to-back -back Coke ovens, huge capacity versus the smaller ones you have like at uh, Nuttleburg where they, you know, they're about a, less than a ton, you know, capacity. So this is an interesting story and uh, you know, you might want to follow up on that, but the, the, there are there are something we, we counted as something like about 50 coal mining towns and some are, you know, some were, um, you know, up the hollers, you know, up, Dunloop Creek, for example, you get some smaller, smaller operations, but they, and some were, you know, some were occupied and used for like decades, whereas some were, sh you know, shorter, shorter run. But, um, but it's all, all connected to the railroad. You, cause you had to transport the, you had to transport your coal and coke out using the railroad. Um, Dave, I've got one more question for you, and then we're going to move on to, uh, uh, um, some of the uh, the, the, the uh, viewers' questions that we've got. Um, uh, we've been talking a lot about the exploration and commerce on the New River Gorge, but can you tell us about uh, some of the first recreational descents? Sure. Um, I think this is like phenomenal, by the way. We really, I spent a lot of time today trying to figure this out. I don't think we know for sure who first ran the New River in a recreational trip. I talked to John Sweet today, who, you know, Sweet Falls is named after. I talked to Charlie Walbridge. I did a lot of reading. Um, most indications are that there was a gentleman named John Barry, who in the 50s, probably 57, uh, ran the New River. What kind of boat he, I'm talking about the Lower Gorge, by the way. What kind of boat he was in is debatable. John Sweet said he was pretty sure it would have been an aluminum Grumman canoe. Um, most of you know this, but that was the boat in the 50s. Um, you know, the aluminum was used in World War II for aircraft. The war's over. What are you going to do with all the aluminum? Somebody said, let's build canoes. And they built what was really an incredible canoe. It's what I started with. Um, it's what Paul Brewer and Jeff Proctor and myself ran all the time. But Anyway, um, we can't get the answer from John Barry because he's passed, he's gone. Uh, but I would say most people would tell you, he was with canoe cruisers of Washington, D.C. He was from Bethesda, Maryland. Um, John was also a world, uh, was a national champion C1-er. Um, he had a, a partner in C2 that was probably with him on that trip, along with who knows who else. Um, I did not have enough time to find out. So there's a challenge. If anybody does know for sure who was the first person to run the lower gorge for recreational purposes, I'd love to know. You know, on the Golly, we know, you know, it was Sarah's 19, Sarah Rodman and Gene Rodman's 1959 trip that was, they ran, but they aborted. And then 61 when they did it complete. Um, the 57 trip that, um, that I was talking about was probably a three day trip. Um, there's some talk in, in 62 of a big Eagle Scout trip that was on that ran the Lower New and Grumman Canoes. Um, Bob Morgan, 
who John Dragon really deserves the credit for being the first outfitter on New River. He gets all the respect from me as I can give because he did it right. Um, but there were some people, um, and Bob Morgan was one of them, who ran some trips in the 50s. Uh, he's the one that's famous for the turkey rafts that Paul, R Paul Brewer is made famous for. So who was the first person? Were they in a turkey raft? Were they in an aluminum canoe? Um, a lot of people would tell you John Barry was probably in a full boat, uh, a wooden boat that had a canvas cover on it. Um, John Sweet said, I doubt it. Uh, I think he was probably in a uh, Grumman aluminum. But there are some mysteries to who was first and there shouldn't be mysteries. So we'll just throw it out there to everybody that if somebody really knows, I for one would love to know, please please email me or call me or whatever. All right. Um, okay, we're gonna move on to uh, some of the questions that we've got coming in from our viewers. Uh, first one I'm gonna uh, bring up here is uh, Dave Arnold, this is kind of for you. It's not really a question per se, but uh, a Mr. Frank Fallon, I hope I pronounced that correctly, wants to know if you remember the DuPont diagnostic water rafting trips. Uh, that they used to do with class six. His son is now a lover of uh, whitewater kayaking all over the Southeast because of coming with class six. And he would love to thank you and your partners for everything you've done for the New River Gorge re region. And it has been a pleasure to watch your outfitting business grow over the years. So um, do you remember those trips? I do not, I, I, I wish <laughs> I did. I wish so bad that I did, but I will tell you this. You know, a lot of those trips when we were first starting uh, business were really, really special. Our, you know, our first trip was April 15th, 1978 with West Virginia Wesley. Um, I remember the faces of some of those kids that were on that trip. So um, all I can say is thank you. Uh, people like that is who built our industry. Um, obviously, you had to have entrepreneurs. Obviously, you had to have great guides, which we had all those, but without great guests and and yeah. It's not unusual. A lot of our guests just fell in love with what we have here. And anyway, thank you. Um, hey, uh, David, first, uh, can you adjust your camera down just a little bit? We're just getting your eyes and your forehead. <laughs> I'm trying, I was trying to read something about the recreation, uh, actually. Um, there we go. That's better. Uh, Dylan, I've got a quick question for you. Um, we already talked about your trip uh, that mimics the, uh, the Marshall. Uh, trip, but coming through the lower gorge, what uh, I mean, we talked about the, the Keenies got brought up several times. Was that the most uh, nerve wracking rapid on the lower new, or were there other ones that presented a challenge? That for me, that was probably the most nerve wracking because as we were coming through initially through the Keenies, we had to pick up the paddles as boat was and again there was great pictures yep and earlier as you can see the outriggers on the front of the boat that's what i was describing the difference between a james river bateau and a new river bateau we modified our james river bateau to be able to run on the new so on the front there those splash guards really helped deflect a lot of the water not all of it there was definitely a lot of water coming into the boat and that was for me, that was kind of mildly terrifying because, yeah, as you can see there, I'm pretty sure at that point, Andrew actually got <laughs> knocked down, um, which is also never a good thing when one of the people who is in charge of steering your boat gets thrown from the device that is steering <laughs> the boat. Very terrifying. And not to mention we're on a 43-foot long white oak vessel, yeah. <laughs> as I was explaining earlier. It's not a rubber raft. If you flip a rubber raft over, yeah, there's consequences. <laughs> you know, you flip it back, you hop back in. You flip a bateau over, more than likely you're gonna die. You know, and that's, yeah. and so anybody who is a boater knows you get that exhilaration, that rush when you run white water, you know? And, yeah. and we spent about a week doing it doing running the new river uh the gully the new river drives all that stuff so kind of towards the end it's like ah, okay we're getting used to this the level of excitement that 
occurred when we were running, the lower New River Gorge was unparalleled. I've never experienced anything like it being on that boat just because of all the consequences involved. Um, but yeah, so the Keynes was definitely the, uh, the pinnacle uh, rapid for me, from my perspective. Um, double Z, of course, you know, that's, that's another high consequence rapid that um, was a lot of fun, but it was actually very smooth as we went through it on, on the bateau. Um, but yeah, bikini was terrifying just because the level of water we were taking in and we couldn't do anything about it because we were having to use our paddles to shift from river right to river left. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So, okay, I've got to give I, uh, those, those uh, photos that Jay's been throwing up for Got to give Mark Hill credit for those photos. Those are Excellent. those are fantastic. They, those are very cool. Encapsulate the moment very well. So <laughs> we've we've just got a, a a few minutes left here, guys. So I'm going to try to run through some of these uh, uh, viewer questions. Um, the first one I've got: uh, has, has the river always flowed north? Has there ever been a time that it flowed south from a weather or meteorological event? <laughs> David or Dave, Dave uh, I, I guess well, you're probably <laughs> Dave, Dave, why don't you take that, Dave? Well, the, the biggest event, if you're talking about forever, um, would have been when it was referred to as the Taze and, and the glaciers came down and blocked the river and the river didn't necessarily move south. What it did is it moved west. So if you're in Taze Valley, you're driving from Charleston to Huntington, you know, the, the, if you can imagine what probably happened, I mean, the visual of this is just mind boggling, but to have a big glacier come down, block the new, then have a turn and go west. And then it sort of went up and followed the Scioto and then cut across to Fort Wayne, Indiana, um, where it entered the Gulf of Mexico. So. I mean, that's just kind of hard to explain, yeah. but that would have been probably in the history of time, the most amazing the event. Um, so mm -hmm. here's this giant ice dam. It didn't force the river to go south, it forced it to go west. So uh, that's the best answer I can give. Um, David, first, this one's gonna be for you. We've got a question from a Tracy Irvin uh, through Facebook. Um, she's wondering if there are any planned archaeological digs along the New River in the coming years. Yeah, well, we, we, we've been doing it on a regular basis. You know, we don't advertise them as much for just for security. But yeah, we, uh, we, we do them on a regular basis. You just have to check. And uh, okay. the, park has a, the park has a program for volunteers. So you can follow up with our folks. We have a volunteer coordinator. You can follow up okay. on that. And I've got one here from a uh, Kevin Jones. Uh, when is there any recorded uh, first recorded history of any man-made dams on the New River? What's the is is uh... um, well, uh, you know, you you have, I mean, there's places uh, upstream. If you go up to uh, around Narrows, there are places where uh, there there were. Um, you know, there were mills on the on the river, and they had um, they built built some uh, places that they could impound the water. Um, you know, you also have uh, the Canal Falls, isn't that? I think that has that is a uh, there's a man-made construction there that was to dam the river for the uh, for the water for the power. There was a power plant there. I guess that was part of it. That, but uh, as far as Native American, I can't think now. In there, there are there there are um, examples in, in in a lot of rivers where the Indians had built uh, weirs, where they would take rocks and 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 direct the water in, in a channel down to a narrow area, and they would use baskets to catch the fish. So there there's still some of those around. Um, and then, Hawk, Hawk's Nest is obviously also you know a that you know, and there's a lot of history behind that. Um, and I've got a, a, a great question from a uh, Raymond Philpot. <laughs> um, so, on the gully, he says, on the gully, we have Iron Ring as an example of a rapid 
that man used dynamite to try to change. Um, are there any rapids of significance, especially in the heart of the New River Gorge, where man has tried to do the same and significantly change the course of the river? So not on the New River Gorge, but for Sandstone Falls, we actually had to divert some of the flow over the section of the falls on river left to get the bateau over about an eight foot drop to be able to portage it, to be able to, to be able to portage Sandstone Falls. So, but as far as, as the gorge is concerned, not that I'm aware of, Dave or David, are y'all aware of anything? No, no, I, and that gentleman, again, I can't remember his name, the gentleman from Virginia that was there for the 25th, and you 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 have his you have his uh, atlas there. I can't remember his name, but uh, I don't think he he has a map. He maps all the locations where there were uh, channels and cut. Uh, talking about Dr. Dr. Trout, Trout yes, Doctor. Yes. Yep. He he wrote all the uh, yeah. Virginia Canal Navigation he, Society. He had a he had a, a, a 1970 minibus. I remember that that was yeah. pretty impressive. Oh, yeah. Everything was stuck in there. <laughs> but um, but no, I, I don't think his maps show anything, you know, um, through the, you know, through the narrow, the, you know, the northern, the lower gorge. Yeah, not, not that I'm aware of, um, but yeah. All right. That is actually all the questions that we've got from our guests and all the questions I have for you guys. I really appreciate it. I, I certainly learned a lot this evening. Um, so, so we're going to go ahead and wrap things up and um, everybody, please join us uh, for our next adventure forum on Wednesday, March 3rd at 730, the title of which is The History of Whitewater in the New River Gorge, Part 2. Um, thank you once again to our panelists, Dave, David and Dylan, uh, very entertaining and, and very informative. And to all of our viewers out there, thank you for joining us. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you next time. And this is Chris Hayes signing off from Adventures on the Gorge.